My name is Jack Wigan. I'm the director of the Urban Harbors Institute at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Uh, we are privileged to be part of the steering committee that put this conference together, um, and I'm delighted to be able to uh, introduce uh, the last panel for today's session. Now, up till now, in the last couple of days, we've heard people talk about the uh, predictions on, on climate change and sea level rise and storm surge and so forth. Uh, we heard about the assessment of vulnerabilities um, uh, existing along the shoreline. We've heard a number of speakers today talk about different strategies, whether they're be, being used at the building level or at the, um, or at the uh, utility level. Uh, we're going to take the uh, tack we're going to take at this session, which is called planning and implementation, is one of comprehensive planning, looking at a city scale or a system-wide scale uh, uh, in terms of resiliency of uh, the shoreline, uh, the waterfront and the shoreline. We have four speakers today representing the cities of uh, New York, uh, Boston, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and we have a speaker as well from uh, the uh, Mass Water Resources Authority, Metro Metropolitan Boston's uh, Water and uh, uh, Wastewater Treatment Authority. Um, so without uh, uh, any further delay, I'll ask our first speaker, Mr. Daniel Zarilli. Um, Daniel is the director of the New York City Office of Recovery and Resiliency. We heard a lot about the impact of Sandy on New York City. In the years following that storm, uh, New York uh, did uh, assessments of its vulnerability in the future. And in 2013, uh, released a report called Building a Stronger, More Resilient New York. Uh, Daniel was hired in March of uh, 2014, or his office office was established in uh, 2014, uh, and Mayor de Blasio um, uh, named him uh, the Director of the Office of Recovery and Resiliency with responsibility to implement that plan and to move uh, New York City forward on resiliency matters. So with that, Daniel. Where's my guy with the slides? Yeah. There we go. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Jack. Um, again, my name is Dan Zarilli. I'm the Director of the uh, Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency with New York City. Thrilled to be here today to, uh, to describe some of what we've been working on for the past, uh, really, um, uh, almost two years at this point. I guess I first wanted to just start with where, we'd, where we've been coming from as a city. Um, the city's efforts on resiliency certain, certainly didn't start with Sandy. Um, in fact, it goes back a couple years. And in 2007, we released a, a blueprint for the city as a long-term plan for the city that originally was trying to address a couple key challenges around a million new people moving into New York City by 2030 and the impacts that might have on our infrastructure, our neighborhoods, our housing. Um, and so we, we ultimately laid out a number of strategies for how we were going to be moving forward with that. And this became the, the city's sustainability blueprint. Uh, and most importantly, uh, in this plan was a, a section devoted to climate change and what this might mean to the, um, to the city. Uh, importantly, we had set up two organizations, the New York City Panel on Climate Change, which uh, is a, a group of academics in the region in New York City that advise the mayor and the administration on the impacts of climate change. What are the actual numbers? What are we actually preparing for? Um, and to actually give us real hard numbers on what we should be um, preparing for. And they released a report in 2009 um, with some of those projections, and we'll talk about what those projections are in a, in a minute. The second thing we also did was set up a climate change adaptation task force. And so while Plan YC was very much a, um, be became known and in, in, in many, in many ways branded as a sustainability plan for the city, we launched this effort and we're thinking about ad adaptation back then. The climate change adaptation task force brought together city agencies, state agencies, uh, private utilities, and brought them together to discuss what these projections from the New York City Panel on Climate Change might mean and how to begin addressing vulnerabilities and thinking through plans. And of course, things like that and task forces sound you know, a little overly bureaucratic, and sometimes they are, and it moves at its own pace. Um, of course, Sandy comes in, 14-foot tide, uh, storm tides, wave, 32-foot waves out in the harbor. It was really a massive event. Sort of highlighted our vulnerabilities in a way that uh, a task force certainly couldn't have done uh, in such, such a direct way. In response to that, through all of the recovery operations, the um, the, the emergency response, the immediate rebuilding effort. We had gone through some efforts to get people back in their homes through a really innovative program called Rapid Repairs, where instead of bringing in uh, temporary housing and trying to house thousands of people around the city, we actually put the investment back into their homes and you know, sealed up their homes and provided heat and hot water and all the you know, bare, bare essentials um, to make sure people can get back in their homes and, and living in their homes rather than in trailers, which was really successful. Um, so in the, in the, all that was happening, 
we certainly at the time recognized that there was going to be a chance to be thinking about the long term and, and, and not just rebuilding what was, but rebuilding better. So we set up a task force, the Special Initiative for Rebuilding and Resiliency, as it was called, to really address two key themes. One was uh, coming up with a comprehensive plan for rebuilding those neighborhoods that were hardest hit from Sandy, but also thinking about our infrastructure and the threats it could face in the future. We did this by asking ourselves three key questions. One was, what actually happened during Sandy? And so if you watched it on television, you saw a lot of the, you know, the crane collapse and the flooding and the tunnels flooded and the gas lines, and a lot of it was sort of, at, what was sort of out there in the public's mind was very anecdotal based on what was on television or what we had experienced directly in our own lives. We wanted to pin down and put in one place the analytical framework around what Sandy actually was. How did our infrastructure perform? How did, what happened in our neighborhoods? Uh, you know, where was the water? What time was the water there? Um, all of those sort of mechanisms to understand how our infrastructure performed, how the failures propagated through the system, really wrap that up in one place. Um, for example, on the, the gas lines, which was, the, which was really a, a, an impact that lingered for weeks, the first initial thoughts were that, well, there's no power in certain neighborhoods, so you can't pump gas. Um, only really over time did we, our understanding of that problem develop to, uh, to really understand the impacts through the supply chain and how the entire supply chain really broke down. The port had been closed for four days, so ships offshore couldn't unload their, um, unload their fuel to the terminals. When, they, when the port finally opened up, the terminals were damaged and still being repaired, didn't have power themselves. The pipeline that comes out of the Gulf uh, was, was badly damaged and, and also lost power. So it was, a, it was really a, a many different impacts through the supply chain that broke down. It wasn't a simple answer. And it was, those sort of, it was answering those sort of questions that was really important to us from the what actually happened during Sandy so we could learn the true lessons. The second question we asked ourselves is, well, what could happen in the future? We didn't want to fight the last war. We didn't want to just come up with a plan that was making the city ready for the next Sandy. Uh, Sandy came, Sandy went, Sandy's not coming back. But we know that we face threats as a coastal city from coastal storms. We know that there are other risks that we face. And here's where that New York City panel on climate change work came in so handy from 2009. But we also then called them back into service and asked them to update their projections in 2013 so that we could base our recommendations based on the best available science. And the, the models had changed, and the understanding of certain um, uh, parts of the models had changed. And so we, we brought them back together. They ultimately issued a new plan that we based our recommendations on, and they issued that report in, uh, in 2013. And we'll talk about those projections. But understanding that there's more than coastal storms. It's heat, it's precipitation, it's wind. So it's a broad range of climate impacts that uh, we need to be ready for as a city. So if you can answer those two questions, what happened, what could happen, what do you do about it? How do you actually begin to think through um, the best way to prepare your city for the future? Um, and so we released this, so the plan that we were developing was really around those thoughts and answering those questions with the knowledge that federal funding was likely to be appropriated for the region. And we wanted to make sure, again, that we were not rebuilding just what was. We're making smart decisions. We're buying down future risk um, with those federal appropriations. So just real quickly, what was Sandy? This is, and it, it's, a, it's a fairly simple um, storyline, I think, with Sandy. Sandy itself was very much a uh, a surge-driven event. Some hurricanes have a lot of wind. Some hurricanes have a lot of rain. Sandy itself was very much uh, an idiosyncratic event in its own right, but it was very much a surge event. This is just a, a quick little thumbnail showing the top 10 water events at the Battery in Lower Manhattan. The farthest bar to the right is Sandy compared to the prior nine top 10 water events over the last 100 years. And Sandy far outstrips the others by about 40%. Um, and it did this for a couple of reasons. The wind field, it was an enormous storm, 1,000 miles in diameter. Uh, you can compare that to a Katrina that was only 300 miles in diameter. It was a very unique meteorological event. It took this famous left hook into New Jersey. Most storms will, will run up the coast and out to the North Atlantic. This one took a almost directly left turn. Uh, it would have, it, had it not been reclassified right before it hit the coast, it would have only been the third hurricane to hit New Jersey uh, since 1878, quite in that manner, pushing a lot of water into the harbor as it was doing this. And then. Lastly, it, the timing of the storm itself, with a spring tide and also with the tidal cycles, meant that the surge itself peaked at high tide at the, at the battery in lower Manhattan, so really exacerbating um, the impact of the, of the storm surge. But we also know that we have two tidal cycles in the city, one that comes in from, the, from the, the bay and one that comes in from Long Island Sound. And the storm surge itself actually peaked at low tide up in the, in the, the northern parts of the city, near the Bronx and uh, the northern, in Long Island Sound. So 
The storm impacts we actually had were very unique for that actual storm that hit at that actual time of day in that month even. We know that if, and we did some modeling with the Stevens Institute of Technology on this that showed that had the storm actually come in and we, we, we maximized the effects of it, it had come in nine hours earlier, we still would have had most of the same impacts on the lower half of the city. Tunnels still would have flooded. Many of the coastal communities would have been uh, just as badly damaged. Maybe the water levels would have been a, a, a foot or two lower. But the water levels in the upper part of the city would have been, uh, in some cases, eight feet higher. We could have uh, lost a third of the city's in-city power generation um, in the Astoria Generating Complex. The city's Hunts Point Food Distribution Center, which supplies 50% of the produce in the city, 60% 60, 60 of the produce in the city, 50% of the meat and fish, could have been flooded what that would have meant for, uh, instead of uh, gas lines, perhaps we could have had food lines and, and a totally different set of impacts. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're not just thinking of Sandy as the worst case scenario. It certainly wasn't um, uh, as bad as it was. And even tragically, 44 lives were lost in Sandy, $19 billion of damages and lost economic activity, major disruptions. But we also have to keep in the back of our mind that that may not have been the worst thing that could have happened, that could happen to us in the future. The future. So the New York City Panel on Climate Change numbers. So we know that we're at risk of coastal storms. We'll talk about that a, a bit more. Um, but we use our planning horizons for, um, for, this, for these recommendations that we've made. We looked out to the 2020s, the 2050s, and ultimately the 2080s. And most recently, we've, we've looked out to 2100 for what these projections locally in New York City might mean. By the 2050s, we're projecting an increase in average temperature. Uh, we're certainly seeing an increase in average annual precipitation. Uh, and sea levels, which is gets a lot of the attention around this topic, of course. Our mid-range projections for New York City by the 2050s is one to two feet of sea level rise. That's our 25th to 75th percent confidence interval. Uh, it's our mid-range projection for sea level rise. But the high end of that projection is actually two and a half feet um, of sea level rise that we could see. And that's on top of a foot of sea level rise that we've already seen since, uh, since 1900. So this is something that's already been happening. We have it documented in our, in our uh, tide gauges in Manhattan. Uh, but we're ultimately seeing that accelerate into the 2050s and beyond. And then by 2100, you see the error bounds on this becoming um, wider. There's a two to four foot middle range. There's a six foot high end range. Most of our recommendations in our plan are based on the 2050s horizon. Beyond that point, the error bounds become so large as to um, become unmanageable in some ways of thinking. And we're also planning this as an adaptive plan over time. So we'll be monitoring sea level rise um, and making choices as we go. That's on the chronic side. And this is on the extreme events. We know that the number of days in New York City is going uh, above 90 degrees could triple by the 2050s, and that could have an impact on uh, people, first and foremost, but also our transportation uh, infrastructure, our, our power infrastructure, our telecommunications infrastructure. These are things we need, we need to start looking well beyond um, just the risks of coastal storms and the sandy events. And even today, we know that on the, 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 the coastal events themselves, FEMA's uh, currently going through a mapping process. We had uh, reached out to them a few years ago and said, you know, we think your maps are out of date. We brought them in to reassess the risk in the city, and lo and behold, um, the flood zones that, we, that were in effect at the time that Sandy hit, well, they actually had 218,000 people in, in them in just in the five boroughs alone. When they did their remapping, now we have 400,000 people that are identified in the 100-year floodplain. Looking forward with sea level rise, which of course the FEMA maps don't do, looking forward with sea level rise into the 2050s, that number could double again and we could have 800,000 people living in the 100 year floodplain um, by the 2050s. And so this is, you know, it's a, it's, it's a threat that's continuing to, continuing to grow. Um, but we know, you know, the, the sum on this is that basically that Sandy's only one type of risk that we face. Another way to look at this is financially. We did, we did what, some work with Swiss Re, a global reinsurance company. At, to understand through their own proprietary modeling uh, what are the financial costs to climate change. And we did an analysis with them that was based on keeping the city constant. So just for thought experiment purposes, keep the city constant, no new people, no new asset values, uh, no development in the floodplain, the city as it is today, and keep this exercise in today's dollars. Well, this lost frequency curve, and on the x-axis here we have um, the likelihood of an event on the y-axis, we have the magnitude of the event. And the three lines, the yellow represents today's climate. The orange is 2020s, and uh, importantly, the blue is 2050s. That $19 billion dot there is Sandy in this model. It was a 1 in 70 year loss event to the insurance industry um, with a $19 billion magnitude. We know that looking, if just the climate changes in New York City, that 1 in 70 year event actually becomes a 1 in 50 year event. So it's a 40% increase in the likelihood 
of a sandy magnet or $19 billion event hitting the city. But going the other way, it's a little bit more stark. And remember, this is all in today's dollars with today's city, today's population. Very conservative analysis. That $19 billion impact becomes a $90 billion impact in the 2050s just due to changing climate. We look at this and basically say we can't afford to keep taking these punches as a city. Um, we know that there are federal resources coming into the region to recover from this storm. It's a unique opportunity for us to use these dollars wisely to buy down that future risk. We'll never make ourselves climate proof, but we can make ourselves climate ready and we can buy down that risk to a manageable level. So from this, we learned a couple key things. You know, the, what happened during Sandy, what could happen in the future. One, building codes work. Where we had development, even if it was on the coast, even if it was right on the Atlantic coast in the Rockaway Peninsula, the newest buildings uh, that were built to the most modern floodplain standards did great. In some cases, didn't even flood, even right on the coast. Um, buildings that surrounded them that were not built to those standards, that were older buildings for whatever reason, um, took disproportionate amounts of damage. Uh, from this, we learned that those building codes do work. Our infrastructure systems are linked and regional. I don't think this is a surprise. Uh, just like the storm doesn't obey political boundaries, in many cases, neither does our infrastructure. Uh, the case in point on the, the liquid fuels infrastructure, much of it is, uh, much of it's in New Jersey, first of all, that supplies the city, but also much of it's in private hands, and it pre presents a number of different, different challenges for us, and we need to be engaging regionally to solve many of these problems. Third, prepared communities bounce back quicker. Where we have uh, communities, you know, that people know each other and they have those ties that bind, they're able to come together and begin that recovery process quicker. Uh, we saw this in many neighborhoods across the city. Uh, we also know that underlying challenges can hamper that response, whether it's transportation access, whether it's economic uh, inequalities. Uh, and, and then we also know that the current flood insurance regime is fairly well broken. Um, there's been some changes to that recently, but I think that's going to be a continuing topic that we all need to engage with. Fourth, there's this been, uh, been a false um, argument going on around green versus gray infrastructure, and, and we think it's a bit of a false dichotomy. There's, they, they both have their place. They both need to be, to be thoughtfully analyzed. There are some areas of our city where green infrastructure is the perfect right solution. There are other places where gray infrastructure is. And we also learned that in m many cases, it's hybrid solutions that actually uh, do the best. And so we've been looking across our entire coastline, understanding the geomorphology, understanding the land use, and, uh, and developing tailor-made local solutions to, uh, to reduce these risks. Uh, fifth, Sandy wasn't, again, Sandy wasn't a worst case scenario by any means. The timing of the storm relative to the tide we discussed, you could also do that thought experiment and say, what would have happened had Sandy come in during an August heat wave? And knocks the power out, lots of vulnerable population, uh, either in public housing, in uh, nursing homes, uh, the, the impacts on, um, on fatalities, or the, the numbers of fatalities could have been much higher. And we know that sea level rise is going to continue to make these sort of events more likely. So we think of this as basically, you know, all the argument around climate change, uh, you know, can, can somehow become esoteric. We know that we're vulnerable now. These risks are only increasing, and we have this unique opportunity to invest using the, the federal Sandy supplemental appropriations to buy down that risk now. So what are we doing about it? So we released a plan, um, in fact, two. In March of 2013, uh, Mayor de Blasio came into office and wanted to strengthen our housing recovery operations and make sure that we were advancing the dollars that are going out to homeowners that still needed that help. We accelerated these dollars, also strengthened our resiliency planning, enhancing our own policy and planning and internally to make sure we're maximizing these dollars, working even better with the federal and state governments to make sure we're maximizing the dollars coming into the, federal, into, uh, into the five boroughs, and then expanding the economic opportunity that comes from this spending to make sure that we're also achieving things like workforce development and, and local hiring and, and job creation. To do this, he set up a mayor's office of recovery and resiliency uh, to really push this forward. And underlying all this is the plan that was released in June that is uh, our roadmap for the investments we need to make across the entire city. Based on, again, the best available science that came from the New York City Panel on Climate Change, we laid out an, an, a, a broad range of strategies across all of our sectors of infrastructure and neighborhoods. And we really came to a conclusion early on that there's no one answer to the risks that climate change can pose to us as a city. There was a lot of talk about storm barriers that we can install from New Jersey to uh, Queens and just that's what we need to build and that's the only thing we should do. Our analysis showed that, you know, things like that become, uh, you know, unaffordable, generally unaffordable solutions like that. You can put all your eggs in that basket and probably not be addressing the risk that you need to. Instead, we've adopted what we call our multiple lines of defense strategy where we're, we're looking at the risks, looking at individual neighborhoods, and, and finding locally tailored ways to reduce those risks. 
It starts on our coast. We need to certainly improve our coastal defenses. We, the city had no coastal protection plan before Sandy hit, um, other than some nourished beaches that really served a recreational purpose. Uh, so we need to strengthen those. We're working with the Army Corps and we're doing some things on our own to strengthen our coastal protections. But we also know that we're not gonna stop even coastal storm risk on, on the coast itself. We need to upgrade our buildings. We've already passed um, uh, several pieces of legislation to do just that, but we are strengthening the building code that we know is effective. And um, more challenging is how we handle the 68,000 buildings in the floodplain and the million buildings that we have already in the city and upgrading them for the, these risks all across the city. It's about protecting our infrastructure and services and much of this is not controlled by the city, so we are working in partnership with uh, private utilities, uh, Con Ed on, on the electric side, we're working with the MTA, which is our transportation authority that's a state entity. Um, we're, we're working broadly across all of our infrastructure sectors um, to make sure that we're hardening assets and supply chains that serve the city. and then. It all sort of boils down for us to neighborhoods and na making neighborhoods safer and more vibrant into the future means addressing the risks of climate change. And so we have strategies um, to do just that. Flood insurance is one, addressing the affordability challenge is really important to us um, and addressing some of those underlying social and economic challenges at the same time. This plan itself, we laid out 257 unique initiatives, um, uh, a 10 year plan, much of it's funded, not all of it, and we're still working to fill the gaps that we do have but it's a, it's a comprehensive plan to really reduce these risks um, over the next decade. The plan itself has physical elements. There's, we definitely know there's things that there, we have to build into the future, and we have specific recommendations on all of these uh, uh, infrastructure sectors on the right-hand side of the slide, the coastal protection, our buildings, the utilities, liquid fuels, healthcare se sector, um, a broad range of, of recommendations. It starts again on our coast. We laid out a $3.7 billion coastal protection plan that right now is nearly half funded and we're moving forward protections um, with our own dollars, with federal dollars, with state dollars to begin uh, filling the gaps on our coastal protection, uh, the, the holes we have on the coast. And it's mixes of you know, nourishing our beaches, it's additional sand dunes that are planted, it's uh, offshore breakwaters, it's wetlands, it's living shorelines, but also in certain parts of the city we're exploring uh, tidal barriers on inland waterways. It's a broad range of, and mix of green and gray infrastructure. And that's the first phase of what ultimately is a comprehensive coastal protection plan that we can continue to invest in over time as, as funds become available, but lays out a framework for where we want to get to in the future. Again, in multiple lines of defense. We're, we're also focused on our buildings. Um, it's those, it's strengthening the building code, it, but it's also giving guidance to people who are rebuilding their businesses, rebuilding their homes on how to best address flood risk. And it's things uh, that we've put in place, like a new uh, zoning text amendment on flood resilience. It's upgrades to the building code. It's making sure those are working together for people who want to rebuild. Um, but it's also incentive programs to help them do that because we know that there are some, going to be some challenging situations like uh, our affordable housing um, uh, sector where we need to incentivize some of these investments to make sure that they're being made. And it's common sense things. FEMA will tell you basically elevate all of your structures out of the floodplain, but we know in a dense urban environment that's not a, a practical solution for brownstones in, uh, in Brooklyn or uh, multifamily buildings in the Rockaways. So we've instead instituted recommendations on what we call our core resiliency measures upgrading and, and elevating uh, mechanical equipment, electrical equipment, uh, also structural hardening of first floors uh, for certain flood risk to make sure that we can get wet and be ready to be wet in the future occasionally, but be able to recover more quickly. It's important to us. Uh, we're also working with our, our local utilities about hardening their networks. We worked with Con Ed on, a, on their most recent rate case that went through our Public Service Commission. and. Uh, at the same time, rates were held flat for the next three years. They're actually making, uh, partly through our advocacy, about a billion dollars in storm hardening investments across their critical substations and other, uh, other assets. And more importantly, I think, over the long term, is that they've adopted our projections for climate change into their planning process. And so they're looking at the, uh, the sea level rise projections, the heat projections, the humidity projections. They're using what we have as the best available science in their planning process. That's on the gray side. Of course, there's additional inland green infrastructure that we're advancing, and this is about stormwater management. We're gonna see additional rain. We need to make sure we can handle it without causing additional CSO overflow events as well as uh, water quality problems. So we're expanding our green infrastructure programs. We're also planting more trees. We are doing a broad range of uh, natural 
infrastructure. We have a million trees program that was launched a few years ago, and we're accelerating that. We're at 868,000 trees planted in New York City, um, where I think we're on target to hit our goals um, in the next few years. Those are all the physical things, but there's also social and economic resiliency measures that we um, are looking to push forward. And this focus, particularly on the neighborhoods that were hardest hit during Sandy, bringing those citywide infrastructure recommendations into the local communities, but also thinking about very specific local challenges. And here, flood insurance reform comes up as a, as a hot topic. Uh, and so, you know, the Bigger Waters Reform Act had been put in place before Sandy. We know that that it was causing rates to rise um, very fast on homeowners. And immediately after the storm, it was becoming, it was going to suck value out of, the, out of our coastal neighborhoods. We were pushing forward with risk reduction measures, but not in time to have an impact on people that couldn't afford to live in their own homes anymore while they're trying to rebuild. So we did some serious study on this and ultimately were um, helpful in the advocacy that got the Bigger Orders Reform Act uh, modified this past year. And um, there's still gonna be more challenges as that program gets renewed in 2017, but uh, we've at least put a little bit more uh, rationality into that program and how things get, and how risk gets priced. And I think we all need to be focused on that issue going forward. We're also doing things like uh, land use studies where we want to understand how zoning can uh, play a role in resiliency. And we, we're launching through our Department of City Planning 10 priority neighborhoods where we're looking at zoning and infrastructure as tools for resiliency. In some places, higher density might be in a, the right thing to do. In other cases, lower density. Um, there's also other mixes of land use that we can be exploring. And then there's continues to be other programs, of course. We're just the city and lots of other actors in this. And resiliency doesn't happen alone. We're working with the state through their they have a community reconstruction program. Uh, we're working with the feds where they have their rebuild by design program, um, making sure that within the five boroughs that it's following a template that matches our city priorities and understands our, our, um, our local risks and vulnerabilities. And then the last thing we're, that we focus on, so the physical, the social, the economic, we're also thinking about resilient transformation. And in some cases, this is an opportunity to rethink our city and ultimately get past these challenges and have a better city as a result. And uh, projects like this, which is a, a multi-purpose levy in Lower Manhattan that, let's see if I can, make, oops, that was the wrong button. Oh, I'm going to need some AV help. Sorry about that. A project, when this comes up, um, that basically we've been thinking about flood protection a lot. We've been thinking about climate change um, uh, risks a lot, but we also wanted to make sure that we didn't just have projects that were um, flood protection projects, and that might mean building big walls on the edge of our city. Thank you. Um, this is basically showing, <laughs> instead of the big walls on the edge of our city that would disrupt our neighborhood fabric and uh, how we live and engage with the water, you know, we're a coastal city, just like Boston, uh, you know, be, we're, we are where we are because of the, the harbor, because of the rivers. Um, instead, if we could find ways to build out, and this is a levee that would help um, fill some gaps in some of the lowest lying neighborhoods of the city, but what it also does is, uh, which is unique among many of our resiliency projects, it could help pay for itself. We're creating land. That land can ultimately be developed at higher elevation and provide the levy that we need to protect lower Manhattan, which ultimately generates something like 10% of the nation's GDP, which comes out of our region. So these, these issues, I think, have broader, uh, broader importance than just local issues in certain parts of the city and are part of the entire city's coastal protection plan. But it's these ways of thinking about economic development, about land use, about risk reduction in ways that can actually end up with better neighborhoods as a result. And there are several of these types of ideas that we're pursuing um, all across the city. Do I need to do something next? I really screwed up the tech. I won't admit that I actually went here as a grad student. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> Basically, all of this is nice. It's a plan. And if all we do is develop a plan that, is, that sits on a shelf, we will have done nothing. And so we get lauded a lot for the quality of the plan we put together. And we've won awards. And we've had staff go to London and talk about this and you know, all sorts of different places. But if that's all it is, then it's, it's a failure. It's, it's, it's really not worth the paper it's written on. How we will get judged is, is on the implementation of that plan, how quickly we can put it in place, and how well it actually works. So on that front, we released our own report card, if you will, on these 257 initiatives. I sort of got past this point, good. Um, 
We released our own report card on these 257 initiatives showing basically how far we've come, and this was released in April, so 10 months into the process. So on that coastal protection plan, again, nearly half of it is funded. We're advancing those risk reduction measures. We put 2.8 million cubic yards of sand on our beaches in the Rockaways and Coney Island and Staten Island. So really reducing the risk and making ourselves ready for potentially that next storm that's uh, coming around the corner. But also upgraded our buildings. We passed 16 pieces of legislation through the city council to upgrade the building code, and we're developing uh, and launching a building incentive program. Right now we have $170 million to that program, and we think we need more, but we want to incentivize people to make those common sense resiliency investments into their buildings and into their businesses. Uh, working with Con Ed for those billion dollars of uh, electric grid investments, but also securing additional funds and accelerating our stormwater management programs. Uh, we have an innovative uh, program in Staten Island called our Blue Belts, where instead of building traditional gray infrastructure and pipes, we, we actually use uh, natural streams to manage our stormwater. We're expanding those. They play a critical role in managing uh, precipitation risk into the future. And then on our neighborhoods, you know, so securing the, those flood insurance reforms is vitally important in, in protecting the neighborhoods and where people live as they're trying to recover from this event. Um, and also, uh, the success we've had on coordinating uh, resiliency programs citywide, the, uh, 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 the federal government recently awarded us $415 million for their Rebuild by Design program for projects in the city. Well, those weren't, those weren't just developed out of the blue by the federal government. They, were, they followed and started off as city resiliency priorities that we were end up, uh, ended up able to guide those investments to make sense for, uh, for our city. And so the way we sort of, uh, you know, we love numbers in, uh, in New York City, I guess, 257 initiatives, 202 of them are actually underway at this point. 29 of them are already completed. It's 10 months into a 10-year program. This is by no means, uh, you know, a pat on the back and we're done. This is... Uh, good early progress, but we have a lot more to do. Um, and just to sum all this up, you know, we know that we're at risk. We've been a coastal city. We know that there, the, the risks of these sort of events have been there um, really the whole time. We're now a little bit more aware of those risks, but we know those risks are getting greater, whether it's through the FEMA maps, whether it's through our understanding of the New York City panel on climate change and sea level rise projections. Um, and, and we clearly know there's a cost of inaction. That $90 billion event out in the 2050s is really you know, um, uh, something that should shock us all out of our complacency. But the good news is we have dollars to invest. And for every, according to FEMA, for every $4 you invest in mitigation or resiliency, for every dollar you invest in resiliency or mitigation efforts, there's a $4 and in some cases more payback. So it's a really unique opportunity to make wise investments to buy down that risk. It's a start of a conversation in many ways around climate change and looking into the future. We need to continue monitoring these impacts and um, if and when they're getting worse, we need to be thinking about new solutions at that point. Um, but we, we know right now we can make cost-effective investments to, to manage that risk and set up future generations to make, uh, to make smart choices as well. So um, thank you. Happy to be here uh, and we'll be taking questions. Thanks.